I'm a bug lover myself, not from childhood, by the way, but rather late, uh, when I uh, bachelored uh, a major in zoology at Tel Aviv University, I kind of fell in love with bugs, and then within zoology I took the course or the discipline of entomology, the science uh, of insects. And then I thought myself, how can I be practical or, or help in the science of entomology? And then I moved to the world of plant protection. Plant protection from insects, from bed bugs. And then, within plant protection, I came into the discipline of biological pest control, which we actually define as the use of living organisms to reduce populations of noxious plant pests. So it's a whole discipline in plant protection that aiming at reduction of chemicals. And biological pest control, by the way, or these good bugs that we are talking about, they exist in the world for thousands and thousands of years. For a long, long time. But only in the hundred and, and last 120 years, people started or people knew more and more how to exploit or how to use this biological control phenomenon, or in fact, natural control phenomenon, to their own uh, uh, needs. Because biological control phenomena, you can see it in your backyard. Just take a magnifying glass, you see what I have here? That's a magnifier, times 10. Yeah, times 10, you just open it, you just twist leaves, and you see a whole new world of minute insects or little spiders of one millimeter, one and a half, two meter, millimeters long, and you can distinguish between the good ones and the bad ones. So this phenomenon of, of natural control exists literally everywhere. Here in front of this building, I'm sure. Just have a look at the plants. So it's everywhere, and we need to know how to exploit it. Well, let us go just hand by hand and browse through just a few examples. What is a pest? What damage it actually inflicts on the plant? And what is the natural enemy, the biological control agent, or the good bug that we are talking about? In general, I'm going to talk about insects and spiders or mites, let us call them. Insects, those six-legged organisms, and spider or mites, the eight-legged organisms. Let's have a look at that. Here is a pest, devastating pest, a spider mite, because it has a lot of webbing, like a spider. You see the mother in between, and two daughters probably on the left and right, and a single egg on the right-hand side. And then you see what kind of damage it can inflict on your right-hand side. You can see a cucumber leaf, and in the middle, cotton leaf, and on the left, a tomato leaf with these little stippling. They can literally turn from green to white because of the uh, sucking, piercing uh, uh, mouth parts of those spiders. But here comes nature that provides us with a good spider. This is a predatory mite, just as small as the spider mite, by the way. One millimeter, two millimeter long, not more than that. Running quickly, hunting, chasing the spider mites. And here you can see this lady in action. On your left hand side, just pierces, sucks the body fluids on the left hand side of the pest mite. And after five minutes, this is what you see. Just typical dead corpse, shriveled, sucked out dead corpse of the spider mite. And next to it, two satiated individuals of predatory mice, a mother on the left-hand side, a young nymph on the right-hand side. By the way, a meal for them for 24 hours are about five individuals of the spider mice, of the bad mites, and or 15 to 20 eggs of the pest mites. By the way, they are hungry always. <laughs> and there is another example, aphids. By the way, it's springtime now in Israel, when temperature rises sharply, you can see those bad ones, those aphids, all over the plants, in your hibiscus, in your lantana, on the young, fresh foliage of the spring flush, so-called. By the way, with aphids, you have only females, like Amazons, females giving rise to females, giving rise to other females. No males at all, pathogenesis, so-called. So and they are very happy with it, apparently. <laughs> and here you can see the damage. Those aphids secrete 
some sticky, sugary liquid called honeydew. And this just clogs the upper parts of the plant. Here you see a typical cucumber leaf that turned actually from green to black because of a black fungus, sooty mold, which is covering it. And here comes the salvation <laughs> through this parasitic wasp. Here we are not talking about a predator, here we are talking about a parasite. Not a two-legged parasite, but an eight-legged parasite, of course. <laughs> yeah? This is a parasitic wasp, again, two meters long, slender, a very quick and, and sharp flyer. And here you can see this parasite in action, like in an acrobatic maneuver. She stands vis-a-vis -vis in front of the victim on the right-hand side, bending its abdomen and inserting a single egg, a single egg into the body fluids of the aphid. By the way, the aphid tries to escape. She, she, she kicks and, and bites and secretes different liquids, but nothing will happen. In fact, only the egg of the parasitoid will be inserted into the body fluids of the aphid. And after a few days, depends upon, upon temperature, the egg will hatch and the larva of this parasite will eat the aphid from the inside. And after, and this is all natural, this is all natural. This is not fiction, nothing at all. Again, in your backyard, in your backyard. Uh, uh, absolutely. And, and this, uh, this, is, uh, this is the end result. This is the end result. Mummies, M-U-M-M-Y. This is the visual result of a dead aphid encompassing inside, in fact, a developing parasitoid that after a few minutes, you see halfway out, the birth is almost complete. You can see, by the way, in different movies, etc. And uh, it takes just a few minutes, and if this is a female, she will immediately mate with a male, and off she goes, because time is very short. This female can live only three to four days, and she needs to give rise to around 400 eggs. That means she has 400 bad aphids to put her eggs into their body fluids. And this is, of course, not the end of it. There is a whole wealth of other natural enemies, and this is just the last example. Again, we'll start first with the pest, the thrips. By the way, all these weird names, huh? I, I didn't bother you with the Latin names of these creatures, okay? Just the popular names. But this is a nice, slender, very bad pest. If you can see this, Sweet peppers, this is not just an exotic ornamental sweet pepper. This is a sweet pepper which is not consumable because it is suffering from a viral disease transmitted by those thrip adults. And here comes the natural enemy, minute pirate bug. Minute because it is rather small, yeah? Here you can see the adult black and two young ones. And again, in action, this adult pierces the thrips sucking it within just several minutes, just going to the other prey, continuing all over the place. And if we spread those minute pirate bugs, the good ones, for example, in a sweet pepper plot, they go to the flowers and look, this flower is flooded with predatory bugs, with the good ones, after wiping out the bad ones, the thrips. So this is a very positive situation, by the way. No harm to the developing fruit, no harm to the fruit set, everything is just fine under these circumstances. But again, the question is, here you saw them on a one-to-one -one basis, huh? the pest, the natural enemy. What we do is actually this. In the northeast Israel, in Kibbutz Deliau, there is a facility that mass produces those natural enemies. In other words, what we do there, we amplify, we amplify the natural control or the biological control phenomenon. And in 30,000 square meters of state-of-the-art greenhouses, there we are mass producing those predatory mites, those minute pirate bugs, those parasitic wasps, etc., etc. Many different parts. By the way, they have a very nice landscape. You see the Jordanian mountains on, on one hand, and the, the Jordan Valley on the other hand, and a good, mild winter, and a nice, hot summer, which is an excellent condition to mass produce those creatures. And by the way, mass production, it is not genetic manipulation. There are no GMOs, genetically modified organisms whatsoever. We take them from nature, and the only thing that we do we give them the optimal conditions under the greenhouses or in the climate rooms in order to proliferate, multiply, and reproduce. And that's what we get, in fact. You see under a microscope, 
You see on the upper left corner, you see a single predatory mite, and this is a whole bunch of predatory mites. You see in this apple, you see this one, I have one gram of those predatory mites. One gram, 80,000 individuals. 80,000 individuals are good enough to control one acre, 4,000 square meters of a strawberry plot against spider mites for the whole season of almost one year. And we can produce from this, believe you me, several dozens of kilograms <laughs> on an annual basis. So this is what I call amplification of the phenomenon. And no, we do, we do not disrupt the balance. On the contrary, because we bring it to agricultural plot where the balance or was already disrupted by the chemicals. Here we come with those natural enemies in order to reverse a little bit the wheel and to bring more natural balance to the agricultural plot by reducing those chemicals. That's the whole idea. And what is the impact? In this table, you can actually see what is an impact of a successful biological control by good bugs. For example, in Israel, where we employ more than 1,000 hectares, 10,000 dunams, in Israeli terms, of biological pest control in sweet pepper under protection, 75% of the pesticides were actually reduced. And in the Israeli strawberries, even more. 80% of the pesticide, especially those aimed against pest mites in strawberries. So the impact is very strong. And there goes the question, especially if you ask growers, agriculturists, why biological control? Why good bugs? By the way, the number of answers you get equals to the number of people you ask. But if we go, for example, to this place, southeast Israel, the Arava Valley, along the Great Rift Valley, where the really top-notch, the pearl of the Israeli agriculture is located, especially under greenhouse conditions or under screenhouse conditions. If you drive all the way to Elat, you see this, just in the middle of the desert. And if you zoom in, you can definitely watch this. Grandparents with their grandchildren distribute <coughs> the natural enemies, the good bugs, instead of wearing special clothes and gas masks and apply chemicals. So safety with respect to the application, this is number one answer that we get from growers, why biological control? Number two, many growers are in fact petrified from the idea of resistance, that the pests will become resistant to the chemicals. Just in our case, the bacteria become resistant to antibiotics. It's the same, and it can happen very quickly. Fortunately, in the biological control or in the natural control, resistance is extremely rare. It hardly happens, because this is evolution. This is the natural issue. Unlike resistant, which happens in, in the case of chemicals. And thirdly, public demand. Public demand, the more the public, the public demands reduction of chemicals, more growers become aware of the fact they should, wherever they can and wherever possible, replace the chemical control with biological control. Even here, there is another grower, you see, very interested in the bugs, the bad ones and the good ones, wearing this magnifier already on her head, just walking safely in her crop. Finally, I want to get to, actually to my vision, or in fact to my dream. Because you see, this is the reality. Have a look at the gap. If we take the overall turnover of the biocontrol industry worldwide, it's $250 million. And look at the overall pesticide industry in all the crops throughout the world. I think it's times 100 or something like that, 25 billion. So there's a huge gap to bridge. So actually, how can we do it? How can we bridge or, let's say, narrow this gap, this gap in the course of the years? First of all, we need to find more robust, good, and reliable biological solutions. More good bugs that we can either mass produce or actually conserve in the field. Secondly, to create even more intensive and strict public demand to reduction of chemicals in the agricultural fresh produce. And thirdly, also to increase awareness by the growers to the potential of this industry. 
And this gap really narrows. Step by step, it does narrow. So I think my last slide is, all we are saying, we can actually see it, give nature a chance. So I'm saying it on behalf of all the biocontrol practitioners and implementers in Israel and abroad. Really, give nature a chance. Thank you. Investment in broadband high-speed internet can help small businesses create new American jobs. Small businesses are being formed, dreams are being launched, and at AT&T, we're investing billions to upgrade and build out our wired and wireless networks. Now is not the time to stall momentum or stifle innovation or investment. Jobs, dreams, and the future are at stake. AT&T, your world delivered.